Well, come on, Rebel Church, if you are excited to be in God's house, like I'm excited to preach in God's house, man, it's going to be a good Sunday. It already is a good Sunday, but it's going to get better. Man, as, uh, as, as Chris mentioned there in the video, you might not be a hollaback girl, but I'm a hollaback preacher. So that means that you got to talk back to me. The message will be better and shorter if you talk back. You want to get to lunch on time, then you better be vocal and active. You can say amen. You can say oh me. You can look at the person next to you and say that was for you, girl. Don't do that if it's your wife. Don't do it. As he mentioned, it is our uh, 16th anniversary weekend, and, um, and uh, yeah, it's been 16 wonderful years. And, and, and as promised, I would like to... Um, to de dedicate this song that I wrote um, that has made us no royalties to my wife on this weekend. Strands in your eyes, you color them wonderful, right? You had to be here a few weeks ago, and Pastor Laura preached to get that, right? It's inside jokes. That's what I do to make sure you don't miss church. You want to be cool, get to church. But we are, um, we are in the middle of a bunch of standalone messages, we've been taking the last uh, few weeks to, to really just dive into what God is speaking uh, to the local church and uh, not going off of any series, but just taking it week by week. God, what are you saying this week to your church, to your church, rebel church specifically? We believe this, that as God uh, uh, speaks to, to me as a pastor, my job is to hear from God and then deliver a word to you that is relevant, that is impacting, that you can take and use and that it can change your life, that it wouldn't just be, you know, it wouldn't just be, you know, information, but it'd be revelation. And, and so we've, we've, we've done that over the last few weeks. And, and this morning, I want to um, take a moment to, to, to bring a message to you entitled, It Is What You Think. It Is What You Think. Last week, we, uh, we, we dove into the idea of the new normal. Last week, we talked about the fact that there is a new normal. It's not what you think it is. But in fact, God is trying to bring us into something new. He's wanting us to leave the old behind and step into something new. It's not what the world is, is telling you is the new normal. The new normal is fear, 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 fear. God is saying, no, no, no. There might be a storm on the outside. There might be all sorts of chaos going on. But guess what? I'm in the bottom of the boat sleeping because I got peace in the midst of the storm. We talked about the fact that in order to get a victory, everybody wants to get a victory in life. Everybody wants to, to get a victory. But in, in, in order to get a victory, you got to see the victory first you got to be able to see the victory before the battle begins. Why? Because the battle belongs to the Lord. It don't belong to you. So you can step into any day. You can step into any situation knowing that, that the victory has already been won. That's the difference. Really, that's the difference. Right? When you look around and you look at people in life, and if you've been a part of church for any amount of time, if you've been in and out, you've been here and there, and you look around, you go, man, man, that, that guy, that guy's really got it together. Man, he's just blessed. His business is doing well. His wife is gorgeous. Right? People say that about me all the time. You know? so, yeah, it's just what I hear. But if you look at him, you go, man, man, man. really, what is, what is the difference? I want that. Well, if you, if you want that, then you have to start standing on God's word in every situation and learning how to have peace in the midst of the storm. You have to. When, when chaos is, is all around you, you got you to gotta be like, like David who says, there's a giant huh, talking smack about my God. Let me handle my business. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for followers who aren't passive. He's not looking for passive pansy followers of God. He's not looking for surface level fellowship. He's looking for people who will go deep. Because when you go deep, when you get deep in the waters, then you can stand. I put my faith in Jesus. 
my anchor to the ground. What anchors you? Man, I mean, I'm preaching a message I didn't even prepare. What is going on here? But the new normal is, is that just because we haven't experienced something before doesn't mean that it's not normal. Just because you haven't seen something before, just because it doesn't look like what it what what it's supposed to look like, what it's always looked like, doesn't mean that God's not right up in the middle of it. Working, moving on our behalf. This week, as I said, I want to step into the idea that it is what you think. It is what you think. Right? Have you ever had that moment where, where, where someone is giving you a gift or you're giving a gift and they're just like, is, is this what I think it is? Is, it, is, this, is this what I think it is? Oh, my God. It is. It is what I think it is. And when, when it is what you think it is, you respond differently than if it was what you didn't think it was. Right? If it's a gift from your grandma, you probably know. It's a sweater or a blanket or some socks or some footies. Right? Is this what I think it is? <laughs> I'm, I'm the worst, I'm like, I'm the worst gift opener, right? I, I am like non-reactive. That's just my nature. Like, believe it or not, like, I'm pretty even keel. I'm pretty laid back when I'm not on a stage. I'm an introvert. And so when, when, when I'm getting gifts, like my wife's family, they're all about the gifts, right? They're all about literally you open every card before the gift, and you read it out loud to the group, and then you show what was in the card, right? And then you take the tissue out of the bag, and you pull out the sweater, and you try on the sweater, and you model the sweater. <laughs> then you put it back in the bag, put the trash away, and then you move on to the next card first. And when you're opening it, no matter what it is, you put a smile on your face. <laughs> oh, my God! A turtleneck. I love it. Right. I'm terrible at it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. When it comes to Jesus, when it comes to faith, when it comes to following the Savior, it is what you think it is. It is what you think it is. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. As a man think in his heart. Why does Jesus not think in his head? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Because head knowledge will only get you so far. Head knowledge is about information. Heart knowledge is about revelation. And it is what you think it is. When, when you get a touch, when you have an encounter with Jesus, by the way, that's what our team prays all week long. If you're new around, we've got a lot of new folks in the building this morning. You have to know this about our church. Rebel, what's this all about? Like some of you just came because you saw the name and you're like, I got to see what this is about. What are they preaching up in there? You have to know this about our church. We are not a check the box church. What does that mean? If you're interested in just showing up and checking off your church for the week, just getting your Jesus fill on Sunday and then living like you want on Monday, you're at the wrong church. Rebels love when nobody else will love. Rebels give when nobody else will give. Rebels serve when nobody else will serve with no strings attached. That's why you see a ginormous group of people. We had, we had too many people sign up to go serve the homeless down at Church Under the Bridge. We had to turn people away. When do you hear of that? Why? It's, it's, not, it's not because of us. It's not, it's not me. It's not Laura and I. But it's, it's the vision that God has given us to create in people true fellowship of Jesus. Not surface level fellowship. Because surface level fellowship runs when things get tough. Surface level fellowship doesn't know how to worship your way through the battle. Surface level fellowship runs to every other thing except to Jesus. 
So, no, we are not a check-the-box church. Which brings me to my passage of Scripture found in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. If you got a Bible, if you got a Bible or maybe a glowing eyeball, just hold it up. You got your Bible with you? You got your Bible, right? Hold it up and say, this is my Bible. I, I am. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. We don't, we don't do that. Nothing wrong with that. Mark chapter 5, verse 21, it says, it says this. Mark chapter 5, verse 21, I'll let you get there. Mark is in the Gospels. While you're turning there, while you're scrolling there, while you're flipping there, while you're swiping there. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels. So you'll find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke a lot of the same stories told from different perspectives. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all write the same accounts of, of the Gospel. Is that Russie? Is that Russ? That's Russ. Russie. <laughs> Russ and the Zanzies, they were with us when we left my dad's church to start core building. Come on. So when Chris says first time, my first time in a long time, he's talking to the second row. It's good to see y'all, man. Good to see you, Russ. When Jesus had again crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by that lake. Then it says one of the synagogue leaders named Jarius, also known in Spanish as Haido. That's our worship leader. His name is Haido, not Hiro, Haido. But if you want to be biblical, just call him Jarius. One of the synagogue leaders named Jarius came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come, put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Here we have a man. He's a synagogue leader, so this man has position. He has authority. He has a title. Yet when life was turned upside down, he ran to Jesus. He knew where to go. He knew that his, his title couldn't solve the problem. He knew that his position couldn't solve the problem. He knew that no matter what he did, his daughter was dying. Can you imagine that? I cannot imagine that. And so he runs and he pleads with Jesus. He's like, Jesus, Jesus, you got to come. Like, I don't know what you're doing by this lake, but you need to come because my daughter is dying. Now, the Bible tells us that when Jesus crossed over, he got out. There was tons of people around. This is a ton of people crowded around Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, crowds followed. The Bible tells us why. Because he was a healer. He was doing some magnificent things. I imagine when people got in the presence of Jesus, they just wanted to be around him. Things were happening. He was a mover. He was a shaker. Wherever Jesus showed up, things happened. He had this different kind of word. He was speaking this different thing. He was the, he was the original rebel. He came into time and space and completely, completely shook up the religious system, the governmental system. He came into a time and a space and he says, the way y'all are doing it ain't right. We ain't doing it that way no more. You can either lead, follow, or get out the way. And I'm leading, so if you're going to lead, you're going to have to follow me. Otherwise, you're going to get left in the dust. So Jarius comes to him and he finds him and he gets a hold of him. And Jesus says, okay, I'll go. So you can imagine he's probably elated. But one of the things I want to point out about the scripture here is that the Jarius, no matter what his, his, his title, no matter what his position, no matter how people viewed him in the synagogue, when life gets flipped upside down, it don't matter, it don't matter if they call you a CEO. It don't matter if things aren't right at home, nothing is going to satisfy you outside of an encounter with your creator. And Jairus, he knew this, and so he comes to Jesus. And he gets his attention, and now Jesus is on the way to his house, and that's not the point of, of the scripture. 
But it brings us to an understanding that, that we're in a season where I believe God is waking people up to the understanding of everything that you've been trying to in your life to relieve your trouble isn't working anymore. Everything that you've tried, there's so much chaos, there's so much, so much has been uprooted. So much has had to come to the surface when you get locked down in your house with your kids trying to do your work on your computer, eat your lunch, relax, all in the same space as your family. Can't go nowhere, can't do nothing. Issues start rising to the surface. Can I get an amen? Thank you. All right. Just want to make sure you guys are honest up in here. But it, it, it comes to this point with, with Jarius. Where he has now got Jesus' attention and he's walking and then something happens. Something, something happens. Verse 25 happens. It says, a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Jairus has got Jesus. He ran to Jesus. He did the right thing. He got Jesus. Now, Jesus is walking with him to his home to go heal his daughter. He's in a desperate situation, and this woman shows up. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what the woman's name is. It just simply says that she has been subject to bleeding for 12 years. The, the, the King James Version calls her the woman with the issue of blood. If you grew up in church, you've heard that a million times. I've preached this message probably six times in the six years from this passage. But Jairus has a problem because in the middle of his miracle, a woman shows up and interrupts. And I know if I'm Jarius, I'm like, Jesus, just ignore her. Just ignore her. Just ignore her. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. Woman, you better get up out the way. My daughter is, is getting healed today. I don't know what your problem is. You've been dealing with it for 12 years. I can wait another 10 minutes. Okay? Just move. Don't make me put you in a sleeper hold, woman with the issue of blood. My daughter is getting her healing today. I've got Jesus' attention. Move. But Jesus don't do that. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So we have this woman. She heard that Jesus was coming to town. She heard that Jesus was in the area. She heard. Some of you are here this morning because you, you heard that there was a God, there was a creator who, who loved you in such a way that maybe, just maybe, what you're dealing with on the inside that nobody else can see, maybe, just maybe, this God that your friend, that your mom, that your aunt, that your uncle is somebody you don't know that you met randomly, invited you into this community that serves a God who's bigger than we are, who's, who's in, the, in, in the business of, of making a way where there seems to be no way, who sleeps in the midst of a storm, Maybe that's you this morning. And this woman it hears about Jesus. She says, I've been dealing with this for, for far too long. I gotta get some relief. If anybody can fix me, it's gotta be him. Now, one of the things to note from the passage of Scripture is that it does not tell us her name. It simply says that she's been dealing with an issue of bleeding. Now, if you study the Scripture, you know that it's an internal bleeding and an internal hemorrhaging that's going on within her. And she's been dealing with it. She can't get any relief. But the funny thing is, is that society... as well as the Bible, has now identified her not by her name, but by her issue. Right? She's been dealing with her issues for so long, it has consumed 
who she is. She has forgotten who she really is and now identifies with her issue. So she comes to Jesus going, nobody else can see. This is an internal issue. Nobody else can see what's going on inside of me. But maybe he can. Right? Because if, if, you, if you gash your head open, it's physical. It's external. You can see it. We just need to dab it up. If it's deep enough, we need to put some stitches in it. There's a physical fix, right? If you're throwing up, we know you got issues in your stomach. Maybe need some Pepto for that upset stomach, nausea, indigestion, the D word. <laughs> Cannot say it. Just can't do it. I'm online. I just can't. For, that was for you. I just didn't want you. You're at home. You could actually get grossed out. If you got a physical issue, it's an easy fix. But listen, some of you got some things going on on the inside of you that nobody can see. You're hemorrhaging on the inside and you're hurting on the inside. And you've tried and you've tried and you've tried everything to try and fix what only Jesus can fix. Nobody else can see it. Because you don't show them. You only show people what you want them to see. That's why your Instagram story is so clean and neat. Nobody puts themselves on the bathroom floor in the fetal position crying on their Instagram story. Maybe a few. Those are the really crazy ones. Stay away. Stay away. People only see what you want them to see. But Jesus wants you to know that he sees. He already sees what you're dealing with. He's already experienced it, and he's already overcome it. There's no shame in coming to Jesus. There's no shame. And so she comes to Jesus with her, her issue says that she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. She had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Isn't it crazy that, that, that some of the, the things that we do to try and make ourselves feel better actually end up making us feel worse? Some of the things that we run to in times of trouble because we think, oh, this relationship, I just need, I'm lonely, and so I just need a relationship. I mean, I did background check. He's got three felonies, but that's okay because God will. I got Jesus in me, and so I'm going to bring him up, and I just need some conversation. I just need a man to take care of me. And we run to these things in times of chaos and loneliness instead of letting the loneliness lead us to the Savior so that the Savior can deal with the internal issue so that we don't have to be lonely no more. I don't know how the song goes. Listen, a few, few months, six months actually, after my wife and I got married, uh, we moved to Honolulu, Hawaii to take a position on staff at a church out there. And at the time uh, we got there, my wife was three months pregnant with Asher. And so Asher was... Um, incubated in the, 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 the sand and the sun of Honolulu, Hawaii. And I remember there was this one particular day uh, because we worked, essentially we worked, uh, we had Mondays and Saturdays off. And so every, every Saturday and every Monday, we would do beach, beach trips. We would explore all the different beaches around the island of Oahu. And I remember this particular uh, Monday, we, um, we, we went to, uh, it, it's called a Sunset Beach. And we pulled up and we went out. My wife is, you know, pregnant at this point. And, and we go and, and, and we lay out. And mind you, right, mind you, this is probably, you know, this is probably like seven, eight months after 
you know, getting, getting, getting married. And, and if you remember, you know, you remember that time, you remember the pre-marriage stuff, right? You remember the pre, like the dating, the engagement. If you're a guy, right? We're like, you are, you're working out every day. Like you're shaving, making sure the hair's done, right? Trying to, trying to lock it up, put a ring on it. And then once you get married and your wife gets pregnant and starts eating whatever she, she wants and you just join in the fun and, 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 and you kind of get pregnant as well, you know, not literally but physically, yeah. Um, and, and so you can imagine. We, we go to this beach and, and since I had not been working out and, uh, you know, the shirt had not come off, and so typically, you know, typically I can I can brown. I used to when I was a kid, when I was high school, when I was college, playing football, running around shirtless, lifting weights, doing things like that. I could get this color all over. But after a few years of of not taking off your shirt, like your whiteness reverts back to white. <laughs> okay, just the way it is. So we're laying on Sunset Beach. That was a long setup to the story, but it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I promise. And my wife is five, six, seven months pregnant. I don't know at the time. And we're just laying there enjoying Sunset Beach. It's like nothing we've ever experienced. We're newly married. We're living in Hawaii. This is great. And we fall asleep. And we fell asleep for like three hours. Three hours. It was a long time. Two, three, whatever. Quit fact checking me, Facebook. We fell asleep, and when we woke up, it was like, like, I looked like red, like a deep, like lobster red, you know, that where you could make shapes on yourself. <laughs> and so we get up, and we go home to our 18th story apartment with no AC, just jalousies, right, because not, not a lot of homes in Hawaii have, not apartments have central air because it's naturally just wind blowing it's nice and breezy all the time except when you got a lobster sunburn and I remember laying down that night you know after a few hours taking a shower and going like oh this is getting bad this is getting worse this is getting touchy-feely like this is crazy like I might have got third degree burns and my wife says you know what it's starting to get itchy just like, this doesn't feel right. This isn't good. Like, I'm wanting to stretch. And she says, why don't you take some Benadryl? That maybe might counter the reaction. And I was in such desperation because it was starting to get uncontrollably itchy. And I had experience like this one other time in my life. So I thought, let me take the Benadryl. And I took it thinking that it was going to make me better. But it actually, it actually magnified the problem. And literally, I was like, I could not stop. It itched and burned so bad, she had to take me. In the middle of the night, six months pregnant, down to a hospital that we had never been to in our life. And we sat out there thinking, this was supposed to make it better. <laughs> but it made it so much worse. And you know what? You know what happened? Is we sat outside the hospital, and my wife was just like, I'm six months pregnant, I don't she hadn't eaten. She said, we just need to pray. So we sat in the car. I never went in the hospital. We just prayed. We just like, Lord, you got to move. We were like, we were like Jarius. It's like, Lord Jesus, I need you to lay your hands on my chest. Because I am burning from the inside out. But the point is, what I thought was going to make it better made it worse. And that's the same for our lives. If we're not careful. We have this, this woman who, who said she went to every doctor. She had seen every doctor. She had spent all of her money trying to get rid of this issue, trying to, to find some relief from this identity crisis. She had, she had run to all the places she thought that she could go, and nothing was working. The Bible says that she tried everything. She just could not get better. It didn't say that she never felt better. 
Because a lot of things we run to, they make us feel better for a while. They make us feel better for a minute. But ultimately, if we want to get better, we got to go to the place that it can actually deal with the root of the issue, which is the internal. I wonder if in this time of our lives, these troubles, this transition, the trauma, the sickness that's going on, are we spending our energy and giving our attention to things that have promised to make it better, but only end up making it worse? This woman was consumed by her issue. It became her identity. We've got Jarius who, who was identified by his significance, by his position. And we've got this woman who was identified by her issue, both coming to Jesus. You have to be careful not to let your emotions define you. As well as not letting your status or your achievements because the moment you start believing that you are what you've been through or you are what you do, it creates a bleeding on the inside. The moment that you start identifying with your achievements, this is who I am. I'm the boss man. I'm the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. You know, this is who I am. I'm a successful businessman. I am entrepreneur. I am, I am on top and rising. You are, according to the word of God but not in the way that you try and self, that we try and self-promote. Or, or the moment that, that we identify with our lowest low. That's just who I am. You, you, don't, know, you don't know my, my story. I, I'm depressed. No, you're not depressed. You're dealing with depression. Uh, I've got anxiety. No, you, you're not... You, you're dealing with anxiety. You are not anxious. According to God's word, if you are a follower of God, well, that doesn't line up with medical science. <laughs> listen, listen to me. I'm not disputing medical science. You can allow yourself to become depressed if you do not deal with the depression in the right way. You can allow yourself to become anxious if you don't deal with the anxiety in an internal way. See, the moment that you start identifying with your highest high or your lowest low, there's a bleeding that begins on the inside. Because your sense of self-worth becomes defined by what you do and what you go through and not who you were created by. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and she spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd, and she touched the hem of his garment. That's what the word says. The Bible says that she heard. She's dealing with an issue, and it says when she heard, when she heard, question for you, what are you hearing these days? What are you hearing these days? It doesn't say that what she heard healed her. But it does say that she heard and then she went. She heard about Jesus and she went. This woman has interrupted Jairus' miracle. Why? Because she don't care. Some of you have been dealing with things for so long, you say, I'm just waiting on God. I'm just waiting on my miracle. I'm just waiting on God to move. And God is saying, I'm waiting on you. Sometimes you need to quit waiting and get aggressive. This woman didn't care. She didn't even know. God doesn't need you to be concerned about his schedule. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is all powerful. He is everywhere, all the time, at the same time. He's just waiting for some people to get desperate enough to say, I know you're the only fix. She heard. What have you heard? What are you hearing these days? What are you hearing? 
Because what you're hearing determines how you're feeling. And how you're feeling determines your actions. What you hear determines how you feel. When you walked in the door this morning, why do you think we had people out there with signs saying, glad you're here? Why do you think we got smiling faces out there? Why do you think we don't allow anybody that's a Debbie Downer to be on our welcome team? Welcome to church this morning. Glad you're here. No. No, we got a position in the back for them. We should work the back door. Nobody comes in out, but you, you lock up that back door. We used, we used to have a guy at my dad's church. I know he's not watching, but he was awkward as all get up. We used to call him Side Door Mike. Because <laughs> this dude would literally comment women on their high heels and ask if he could wear them. Can I try them on after? They were like, put Mike on the side door. <laughs> now. We got to wait for Jesus to show up in his life before we can promote him. <laughs> but we still want him here. We still want him serving. We still want him close to the spirit of God. But, but, but what you hear determines how you feel. <laughs> and that's why, right? That's why when someone says, man, you look good, girl. It's Sanchez. Right? Man, you're looking good. What's up? Is that some new? Did you get your hair done? What does that do? That's like, oh, yeah. You get a pap in your step. Why? Because what you hear determines how you feel. So if you ain't feeling good, you need to contact trace your thoughts back to where they came from. There might be some, some people in your life you might need to eliminate. There might be some conversations that you need to put on hold. Because what you hear determines how you feel and how you feel determines what you do and where you go and the action that you take. Which is why this woman who heard Jesus had come to town was like, I got to go. She heard. But hearing wasn't enough. Right. You can hear the word of God. You can show up every single Sunday and still leave worse than when you came because hearing doesn't heal you. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God and applying it to your life. That's why he's, that's why he's in James says, don't be hearers only. That's foolish. Be doers of the word. If you work the word, it'll work. It says that, that she came and she touched. Instead of waiting for a touch from God, she made up her mind to go touch God herself. You got to touch God for yourself. You got to touch God for yourself. You got to quit waiting until you feel like worshiping. And you got to go after God. Why, why, I just don't understand why people lift their hands up. What is that all about? I, I'm very introverted, and I don't even like to sing, except when my jam comes on, then I don't mind singing. But <laughs> I don't know all these church songs. Learn them. Why do you lift your hand? It's an international sign of surrender. It puts your heart in a position to receive, to encounter. It's saying, God, I'm coming after you. I'm not sitting here waiting for you to touch me. I'm trying to reach out and touch you. There is no social distancing with God. He wants you going hard after him. She thought, verse 28, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She heard about Jesus, so she went. Not only did she go, 
she actually reached out. It's not enough to hear. It's not enough to go. You actually have to reach out. We live by faith, not by sight. So if you can see it, it's not faith. She heard about Jesus. She got close to Jesus. But you got to make the decision. I'm going to try and touch him. I don't care what his schedule is. I don't care what I think is going on. I don't care if, if I think I'm lowest on the totem pole, my priorities. If he doesn't care about this minute detail, I'm not dealing with an issue of blood. I'm just dealing with a minor thing. It don't matter. God wants to meet you right where you are. He's powerful enough. He can do it. The biggest of need, the smallest of need. He's just waiting for you to reach out. Let me ask you this. What do you think it is that stopped the woman's bleeding? Anybody front row, my front row folks? Faith? Well, that's, that's what the Bible says. That, that's, that's what he says, right? Verse 28. Look, look at it. What does it say in verse 28? It tells us. This is because she thought if I just touch the clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Here's Mark. And what Mark likes to use is the word immediately. Look what it says. It says, because she thought, because she thought, what did she think? If I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Because she thought, immediately her bleeding stopped. So the healing happened, the miracle happened when she thought it. It came to pass a few moments later when she acted upon her thought. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You're already healed. <laughs> Come on, God's already overcome your issue. You just got to start thinking. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know and be able to test and approve what is the good and pleasing, perfect will of God. The good and pleasing, perfect will of God is that you are blessed, highly favored, empowered to prosper, impossibility of curse, anointed to win, healed, whole, Above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. Blessed when you come and blessed when you go. That's the truth of God's word. It's renewing our mind to think that, but then actually taking steps towards seeing it happen in our life. And here's this woman. It says that she thought it and immediately at that moment in real time, the bleeding stopped immediately after she thought she she heard about Jesus she went to Jesus she had a thought and she touched him and so what we learned from this passage is that you can stop your internal issues with a thought you can stop it with a thought you can stop it with a thought somebody needs to hear that this morning what are you allowing to consume your thoughts, right? Because I imagine this woman had a million other thoughts, right? Like, well, but, what if, but what if I touch him and nothing happens? What if, what if I go to touch him and his bodyguards, they like, what if he turns around and rebukes me? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? It only takes one thought. It only takes one moment for the Holy Spirit to speak into your life and give you revelation to say, if you will just reach out, this is your moment. Listen, just like her bleeding started on the inside, so did her deliverance. The deliverance started on the inside. Made its way out. Listen, it is what you think. I'm here to tell you this morning, it is what you think. If 
you will renew your mind and, and be transformed by, by God's word, and if you allow yourself to stand on God's word, this is what God's word says about me. This is who I am. I'm not identified by my issues. I'm not identified by my achievements. I am who he says I am. And so I'm going to live according to that. And my thoughts Listen, sometimes you need to hold a thought. Hold that thought, please. That's why the Bible says that we, we take captive every thought. The Bible tells us to take captive every thought and make it obedient to God's word. So when, when, when thoughts are roaming through your mind, when, when, when God is trying to deal with you in a moment in the midst of worship, I'm going to look stupid if I put my hands up. No, you're going to get free if you put your hands up. Well, I, I can't really sing. The people around me, they're going to know I'm off key. Boy, you don't even know what key is. Just lift your voice and sing. You wouldn't know if you were in key or just sing. Just worship. You will get free from some things. If you will just allow yourself. A rush at me this morning. Your feelings follow your thoughts. Your thoughts drive your actions. And here's the good part. Here's the good part. Verse 30. At once Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? The disciples said this, you see people crowding around you? And yet you can ask, who touched me? Come on, Jesus, we ain't got time for this. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the what? Whole truth and nothing but the truth so help me God and you know she didn't give him the cliff notes version because she was a woman I ain't, I'm not trying to stereotype Crystal I ain't trying to stereotype I'm just married to one ain't no cliff notes stop laughing we're supposed to be serious right now and she came to Jesus and it's like Jesus look it was me I did it but you don't understand, man. I've been dealing with this thing for 12, 12 years, Jesus. I didn't know what else to do. She was frightened. She thought she had done something wrong, like a, like a thief in the night trying to come in and steal a blessing. And look, look at this. Look at this. It's powerful right here. You don't get nothing else out of today. Listen right now. Wake up. If you're sleeping, wake up. Look at your day and make sure their eyes ain't closed. If they are, slap them. Just give them a good slap on the back of the head. Just tell them like they told them. They needed to just say, the Lord had need of it. The Lord had need of me to slap you. In the midst of all the chaos, Jesus turned around. He's like, who, who did that? Who was it? Who was it? Look, he realized the power had gone out. And he looked around. The disciples were like, it's not important, Jesus. We're on our way to a miracle. We got work to do. We got work, work, work. Come on, let's go. Heal a little girl. This would be good for Instagram. I mean, we could tweet. You could get all your followers. Man, come on. Why are you messing around? And look at verse, look at verse uh, 34. Look at, he calls her back and he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to, to understand from, from there. Why did, why did he stop her? Why? Why did Jesus stop? It's a crowd of people. He's on his way to heal. He felt somebody touch him. Why did he take the time to stop and say, who was that? Who was it? Because you know she was like sneaking out. She knew what happened. She's like, oh my God, I'm free. It says she felt it. She felt she had been free. Yet Jesus takes the time to say, come here. Come here, come here, come here, come here. I cannot let you leave. I cannot let you leave with the blessing without meeting the blessor. 
right? And it's not, it's not what he told her because he told her what she already knew. It's not what he told her, it's what he called her. He said, I cannot let you leave here knowing that you've been healed because you can walk away being freed from your issue but still have issues. If you don't know this one fact, is that you are a daughter. You are not the woman with the issue of blood. You are not your issues. You are not your achievements. You are a son or a daughter of the Most High God. You are an heir and a co-heir with Christ. And he wants you to know this morning, he wants you to know this morning that he blesses you to be a blessing. That he heals you to be a testimony. And that the thing that you've been waiting on, God, is waiting on you. God, I want to get free. I've tried this before. I've tried this before. I've tried this before, and it just doesn't work. Maybe you need to do it God's way. When you do it God's way, you don't get a say. Because what God did for that woman is he he not only freed her from her sickness he freed her from her shame she no longer had to walk around with her head down being known by her issue she was now son daughter of the most high God and here's the thing you gotta know that you belong to him and that you always go to him for the fix. Because there's some things that can only be detected and you can only be delivered from by your designer. There are things deep on the inside of you that you're not even detecting right now, but the designer of you, the creator of you knows that they're there. See, the sooner that you will deal with the hard issues in life, the sooner you will get completely free. You gotta let this, you gotta let the deep stuff rise to the surface so that God can deal with it. The abuse that you suffered, God wants to deal with it. He wants to heal you from it. He doesn't want you walking around in shame. I don't know who I'm talking to, I'm talking to somebody this morning. The abuse that you suffered, what happened to you was not, wasn't right. What happened to you? God wants you to know that you don't have to be defined by it. It doesn't have to rule your life anymore. That he can free you from it if you will just reach out and touch him. He's already done the work. But in order to get a victory, you got to see a victory. And it starts with an encounter with your creator. With every head bowed and every head closed in the building this morning, you just want to take a moment and pray that's you maybe 